The True Story of the Sword and the Stone The Life of St. Golgano Translator's Preface It is with great joy that I present for the first time in the English language a work for any length on St. Golgano. Some of his story is already known to English-speaking audiences, though through entirely other means, namely the medieval stories of King Arthur. The Sword and the Stone, though a significant miracle in St. Golgano's life, is but a divine confirmation of his calling to penance, prayer, and sacrifice for souls, whereas the Arthurian legend it is centered around the establishment of an earthly kingdom. This introduction into the Arthurian legend is late, around the 14th century, and most certainly has its origin in the story of St. Golgano. From the 18th century to the present day, it was thought that the sword was a fake and a local medieval legend. This was completely shattered in 2001 when scientists from the University of Pavia, headed by Luigi Garaccelli, conducted a study on the sword and found that it was indeed authentic. The metallurgy was of a 12th century composition, employing no modern alloys, simply being tempered iron. The cavity in the rock outlines the blade exactly, something entirely beyond medieval technology. Even a sword composed today could not produce so exact an entrance into a boulder. This miracle should be taken as God's confirmation to Galgano of the life he was to lead, and not something deserving admiration in itself. May the reader find inspiration from this obscure saint, not only to conquer sin, but to strive to empty himself of the love of this world, and look upon God, for whom our hearts were made, and without whom they are restless. In the famous and beautiful words of St. Augustine of Hippo, Cor nostrum iniquitatum est, donac requiescat in te. Ryan Grant The First Years of Galgano In the year of our Savior, 1148, Galgano was born of Guidotto Guidotti and his wife, Dionysia, in Cesedino, which, though today is a little country, was in the times which we write, populous and possessed of a strong castle situated on a steep hill at a distance of about eighteen miles from Siena, in the direction of Massa Maritima. Little is known of Guidotto Guidotti's lineage, for the family of Guidotti was distant and ascribed to the citizens of Siena, which at that time was a very considerable republic and among the most powerful in Italy. To call this to mind, is not so as to add any luster to the merits of Argogano, as if a birthplace can be an asset increasing unto virtue, but indeed renders more despicable his vices. Rather, it is only to serve the truth of history, which circumstances also show how important the castle of Chaosadino was in the Middle Ages. Since he was provided with an abundance of goods, Guidotto could give his son the best education, that the roughness of the times allowed. He was perverted by bad examples which, unfortunately, abounding in that age, for idleness is a frequent companion of affluence, and thus Galgano abandoned himself to all the disorders of unbridled youth. His exceedingly afflicted parents, who were mannered and religious, tried every means to recall him to the right path. Sadly, during this time, Galgano's father died. But now, without remonstrating with his son and reminding him of holy things, always hoping in the infinite mercy of the Lord to bring his wayward son to conversion. The reprobate Galgano, being free from the subjection of his father, launched himself with greater impetus into that whirlwind of passion until it pleased the Lord with a particular stretch of his mercy to stop him in the middle of his course and call him to the road of salvation. His conversion. While away from his mother, Galgano stayed in Siena to pick a home better suited to entertainment and pleasure, and with a secondary sight set upon a military career. This was very dangerous, not only as it is today, but more so in that time as it was seldom separated from violence and robbery. Then, however, he was struck by the following vision. In the middle of the night, St. Michael the Archangel appeared. He saw also his mother, to whom St. Michael was speaking, 
admonishing and encouraging her to consent to the idea of her son enlisting in the heavenly militia. What honor such a gift should bring to her motherly heart! Galgano saw her bow deeply and nod her consent, then saw himself follow the footsteps of the angel. The young man became restless, and with a sudden resolve abandoned all his amusements, the very things that kept him in Siena. He returned to his father's house, and in a humble and affectionate manner he told his mother of the vision. Surprised by the sudden change in manners of her son, she gave thanks to the Lord, and amiably congratulated him for such a change. She encouraged him to persevere in the good sentiments he had conceived, and to follow God in the measure of his infinite mercy had made known to him. The words of his mother added stimulus to the deep impression that the blessed vision had left in him, and from that moment he purposed to change his life completely. With fervent tears, Galgano asked God for forgiveness of the foul deeds he had committed, and he suddenly understood all the ingratitude of which he had been guilty towards the Creator and the Redeemer of mankind. All the earthly delights, entertainment, and pomps being left behind, he retired to his father's house, and, for some years, it is believed, four or five, led an obscure and penitential life. St. Galgano is admonished in the vision to retire to Mount Seepe to do penance. Translator note, Seepe in Italian means hurdles, obstacles to overcome. The Lord looked with favor on the change and perseverance of Galgano in whom such grace had been worked, and he deigned to send another vision in order that he might call him to a very great penance, one to which Galgano was destined by divine mercy. Once more, while Galgano slept, Saint Michael the Archangel appeared to him. With mysterious images, the Archangel made known that he ought to embark on the path to Mount Seppe, about four miles distance from Chaosodino. At that time, this was a solitary place covered with thick forests. There he must offer every worldly comfort as a sacrifice for his past sins by carrying out the most bitter penances. Galgano was anxious to tell his mother the new vision. Sadly, she who had so desired the conversion of her son, as well as his return to sober and good conduct, also longed so very much to have him close so that he might bring relief to her advanced age and that he might stabilize the secession of the family. Thus, she was greatly disturbed at the thought of losing him and tried to persuade him that he could still serve God in society, that he should not abandon her once more when she was in necessity, and while he undertook good behavior, she needed much consolation." Grace had already taken possession of his heart and began to lift it above all human respect so that all things should yield to the divine will. It is best for a man that he ought to come to what he has been prescribed by God to whom we owe everything and without whom we would be nothing. For his commands are sacrosanct and a man cannot transgress them without impiety. Galgano pleaded with prayers and tears but it so displeased Dionysia to be deprived of her son again that he did not attempt other means of trying it. Nevertheless, she turned to her relatives and took counsel with them. Together they determined that they should propose a girl to Galgano as a spouse, and such a one that he could not refuse. There was at Civitellia, a big castle about twenty miles distance from Chaosadino on that side of the Merimamma, a man by the name of Antonio Brizzi. Fortune had made him very wealthy, though he was of common birth. He had a daughter by the name of Polisena, who was very beautiful and charming. Galgano's mother set her heart upon this idea, as did his other relatives, and they sought out Brizzi, to pursue their purpose. Having made an agreement as to the marriage contract, they proposed it to Galgano. Though he resisted every argument and persuasion for a long time, eventually he was won over by their persistent hassling, and he forgot for a moment the injunction received from the archangel. Thus, 
he promised to go see the lady Polesena. With this purpose in mind, Galgano quickly prepared to make the journey from Chiesadino heading towards Civitellia. He had not gone yet four miles when suddenly, in the plain called Morella, near Roreno, his horse stopped and refused to move a step further, though spurred and struck with much energy. Galgano dismounted and fell down upon his knees. He immediately recognized his failure, and he implored forgiveness and help from the Lord so fervently that he saw again the archangel St. Michael, no longer merely in a vision, but in reality. Right away he gave the command that Galgano should follow him to Mount Seppe. The archangel then left, saying that there, on Mount Seppe, Galgano must do harsh penance, because, as of that very moment, he was enrolled in the army of heaven. Overwhelmed and contrite, Galgano fell to the ground, and having drawn his sword from his side, he exclaimed, How do you deign, O merciful Lord, to show so much favor to a miserable sinner? Ah, but I could more easily plunge my sword into this stone than obtain forgiveness for my many sins. Having said this, he thrust his sword into the rock until the whole of it was immersed up to the hilt. This may be observed even in our times in the present chapel of St. Gogano above Mount Seppe, where there is a boulder with the sword enveloped in stone and guarded well by an iron grate. In view of this singular miracle, every fear as well as every importune care was banished from Galgano's mind, and he began to back away reverently, fervently venerating the cruciform shape that the sword's hilt now presented to him, as it was now enveloped by rock up to the hilt. Galgano wished to observe nothing else, that he might have continually before his eyes the infinite mercy of the Lord. It would be difficult, and indeed, it is not allowed for me to describe the contemplative and penitential life which Galgano led for the space of a year, less two days, wherein he remained until his holy death. Yet, what was received by God we do know, for the graces dispensed by his intercession produced the swift and constant devotion in the hearts of the people inspired by heaven towards our saint. There were many other signs of divine favor as well, of which, but this is neither the time nor the place to go into them just now. The brevity of his penance should not surprise us, since the Lord granted equal wages to the workers that came to work in the vineyard at the last hour of the day as to those who went early in the morning, and who showed us the piety of the father of the prodigal son that a true repentance a firm hope and a burning love disarm promptly all its penalties. That God knew how sincere were the first years of Mary Magdalene, and sent her back affectionately justified. He is only just, he is the only just appraiser of our merits, the only searcher of hearts, the only exact distributor of thanks, and we have to adore his infinite justice and mercy, and thank him for what he has so freely imparted without our own merit, and recognizing that it is only through one's own fault that he fails to bear interest for those talents that each individual has received. Galgano, meanwhile, increasingly became more fervent in the rigor of his penance, both in fasting, which the locality forced, since no food could be found other than roots and some wild fruit, as well as in the rigor of the climate, since he began to make his home there on December 1st without any shelter. He suffered the instant deprivation of any comfort of all pleasure and all human company. These were no small sufferings, since need ought to afflict the flesh very much, and particularly in his person, which until then had lived in the midst of comfort and solace. The evil seducer thought the disgust of such a harsh life could encourage his evil designs. To set about removing Galgano from this place by making the comforts and friends he had left behind appear in his imagination. At other times he brought to Galgano's mind the difficulty of continuing among so many deprivations, 
striving sometimes to scare him with vain terrors, which increased the loneliness and sadness of the place. It was always in vain, because the grace of the Lord preserved him in every such encounter. For God comforted him with a lovely miracle of four oaks bending over him, weaving their branches to shelter him far more comfortably than the shelter he had made for himself. Thus God willed for Galgano to remain in order to confound and destroy the evil adversary. Seeing that he could not win this way, the enemy of mankind began instead to attack Galgano's conscience with respect to money and goods that he may have appropriated unjustly during his earlier life. The evil one made it seem to Galgano that it would be a good thing to go back to Quesodino and work at acquiring the needed goods to return everything out of justice. Having anything left, he could remain and distribute it amongst the poor. It was seemed likely to the devil that having once again returned to civilization, Galgano would be loath to return to his penitential life. Since Galgano had already abandoned all cares, and had firm trust in God, he was waiting for the means therewith to accomplish this restitution without leaving the place of his retirement. With the grace of God, he avoided this new and most alluring deception, dressed up in the most honest of appearances, and he remained waiting for the right moment with firm faith that the propitious moment would arrive in short order. Some young men from Quesadino were stringing their bows to hunt in the vicinity of Monte Seppe. One of them went away from his companions and climbed to the summit where he found Galgano. At first he could not recognize him. Since he was in tattered clothes, his face emaciated, and he was in fervent prayer. The disruption had not distracted him. Galgano seemed an unknown and extraordinary object. The young man did not know what to think until he looked more closely and recognized this apparition as Galgano. Calling him by name, he said, What are you doing here in this place? Your mother and everyone else believe you are in Civitalia, near your bride. Now why are you in this wilderness? To which Galgano replied, The Lord called me to this very place so I should be far from the nonsense of the world. Yet I beg you, for your charity, if you would deign to give me a bit of clothing, in order to repair for this season, as well as for decency. Surprised and moved, the hunter gave him a pelt, which with to cover himself, then ran back to Quesadino to tell everyone he had found Galgano. The unexpected news surprised everyone. Some were very moved, while others, as unfortunately happens, began to mutter about Galgano, by suggesting frivolity and being of unsound mind. After all, how could a man look upon all human things as despicable when he had formally put all his trust in them? News came to Galgano's mother, and she came together with her relatives, who were taken aback by the news. They wanted to go to him at Mount Sieppe, so that they could try to reason with him and change the young man's mind. The family worked together as one to try to persuade him to abandon his work by distortion and recall him to Quesadino. As he was supported by grace, however, he was not only able to resist them and justify his conduct, he was able also to console his mother. However, they were not given to defeat. Withdrawing from him, they found it advisable to go and fetch the proposed bride and her father, Antonio Brizzi, so as not to leave anything untried. They returned together one day to that place, so as to give a new and more vigorous assault. The vain maiden, in a lowly act, blushing and sorrowful, nearly reproached him for his disregard. Her father was confused. The urgent relatives thought of going back, and above all, his mother, sighing and weeping. Together they caused such a scene that for one to resist, a force was required that was more than human. Galgano's heart wasn't insensible towards these sweet sentiments, but the divine remained present, and worldly feelings were already in this respect so much more revolting that he did not diminish from his purpose. Rather, he resolved to renounce all things forthwith for the love of God, 
not intent upon the mere human satisfaction, but to pursue the true good of souls. Thereupon, Galgano showed his mother that true happiness for them both was to be perfectly conformed to the divine will in which alone all goods can be found. He spoke to his would-be bride so efficaciously that she was soon made to understand the vanity of worldly satisfaction, and her soul was instantly turned to the Lord alone. That very day she attempted to retire to the convent of St. Prospero in Siena, of the Cistercian order, which had just been founded. Indeed, she has been regarded by many as having been the founder of that convent, where she was consecrated to its faculty, and there led an exemplary life. Next, Galgano spoke to his relatives, and he so convinced them that, silent and thoughtful, they left him, and no more had the courage to disturb him. Before they left him, he wished for his mother to bless him, commending himself to her prayers, as he did also for all the others, who then narrated in Quesadino with edification what they had seen and heard. After surviving this most vigorous temptation, that of blood and friendship, our hermit found peace, and only thought to double his penance and bind himself to heaven with a more fervent spirit. He conveyed his attention to his mother that, having kept what was necessary to his honest sustenance, he ought to arrange his abiding faculties in favor of the poor, and first of all, any whom he might have damaged in any manner. Then he decided to head to Rome to take indulgences when it was in the pleasure of the Lord. For several days he prayed for this particular intention. Then, having attained with certainty the signs of the Lord's consent, he disposed himself to the pilgrimage. He suffered and practiced on the road every act of Christian humility, asking alms and charity, and employing himself in the service of every need he met on his journey. Arriving in Rome, he immediately went to St. Peter's, and there, at the foot of a confessor, he exposed his past life with such feelings that from them it was supposed that he ought to receive absolution. It was a confirmation of the forgiveness the merciful God had already manifested through the earlier miracle, when he saw the harshness of the living rock yield to his sword and into which it was wholly submerged. He visited the seven churches for the acquisition of indulgences, and then presented himself to the reigning pope, Alexander III, of the Bondinelli family of Siena. Galgano was received lovingly, as he was already known to the pontiff by his reputation, and encouraged to ask for whatever he wanted. Galgano replied that he longed for three favors. The first, that his holiness would continue to persevere in the good governance of the church. Secondly, he wished that the pope would grant him the relics of the holy martyrs Fabian and Sebastian, as well as Pope St. Stephen, which he had as his particular patrons. Thirdly, indulgences for the dead of his family, particularly for his father as well as those still living, and, above all, for his mother. The Pope replied with this kindly summation, that in the first place he hoped, with the Lord's help, that he would persevere on the path he had undertaken. As to the second, he had given the order that the requested relics should be prepared, and to the third agreed with the usual formalities of the time. Meanwhile, the rector of Quesadino, as well as the abbot of an abbey called Serena, a mile away from there, incited by an infernal spirit, took counsel to assail Gagano in his solitude, and there to sacrifice him to their envy, and impious anger kindled only by his penances, which were greatly contrasted with their relaxed way of life. They took with them an armed lay brother to Mount Sieppe. Not finding Ogano there, they raged against the sword. Since they could not pluck it up from the rock, they beat it with several blows, breaking it into three pieces, which they then threw to the ground. They burned the oaks which formed the hut of the saint, and destroyed what was there for his use. Soon after, however, they paid the penalty of their crime, because on their return a horrible storm arose, and lightning struck the abbot. The parish priest was drowned in a creek called Regeneto, and the lay brother, 
had his arms ripped off by two wild wolves, which are still preserved intact by divine permission in the chapel mentioned above. While Galgano was staying in Rome waiting for the relics which the Pope had promised him, he was miraculously informed of what had happened to his hermitage, as well as what had befallen the offenders. This he lamented more than any injuries he received from them. Intent upon returning to his solitude, he urged from the Pope the promised relics. When questioned by the pontiff about several things, he related that he was informed by an angel of the damage done to the sword hilt which served as his crucifix, and his hut, as well as the exemplary punishment of the evildoers. The Pope, astonished and fearing it to be true as he claimed, sent with the utmost care and secrecy a quick messenger to Mount Sieppe, and meanwhile ordered Galgano to come back to him in a few days. The saint obeyed, and prayed to heaven that the mind of the Pope should be moved to let him go. He went back to the predetermined time, and found the Pope to be in a better disposition, having been inspired by the Lord that he should no longer delay his servant. Therefore he would send him, and handed over the relics to him. At this moment the messenger returned, bringing the most exact confirmation of what Galgano had related. The Pope was surprised and moved. Therefore he blessed him, and recommended himself to the saint's prayers, since he had already discerned in him a true servant of God. With the precious treasure he so desired, Galgano departed from Rome and resumed his pilgrimage on the road to his hermitage. The distance of time, lack of memory, and above all, the saint's humility let him entirely ignore the many acts of Christian virtue he exercised on that arduous journey, as well as the many graces he received from the Lord. Finally he came to Monte Sieppe, and upon seeing the havoc committed by those wicked men, he became so sorrowful and disheartened that he thought he should choose another place more segregated and far away. There, quietly and without fear of any disturbance, he could abandon himself in all fervor of his penances. But heaven prodigiously made him resolve that he ought to remain there. He began to take into his hand the pieces of the broken sword and prayed to the Lord that he would will to grant him to venerate the hilt in the image of the cross as he had done before in his departure, that drawing them together they might be miraculously united. Heaven granted his request and upon having witnessed another miracle granted from on high, Galgano burst into thanksgiving and tender effusions of his heart towards his benefactor and loving father. He placed the sword remade into the same opening that was first formed so miraculously. After fervent prayers, Galgano thought to build a hut of planks, since it was not possible to be exposed to the elements without coming down with a serious disease. It was of such small dimensions so as to be just tight enough to cover him, which required little labor to build. Being so settled, he ordered his daily occupations, imploring those few hours in which he desisted from prayer to cut wood and make bundles of kindling in the service of the poor. Thereupon he took them on the public road, where he made a ditch for them, so that they could be collected by the poor without fatigue, to free them from the loss of time they were previously obliged to find them in the woods. Translator's footnote. Today this might seem as a minor work. However, in the 12th century, peasants spent a great deal of time collecting firewood for their heat, laundry, and kitchen. We can understand what a great act of charity this is when we realize that whole days were saved for women and children to spend more time with their families or in prayer rather than collecting firewood. He learned, meanwhile, of a holy man named William, who had assembled a community of religious penitents in common life about twenty-five miles from him, where there were wonderful fruits of the spiritual life. The desire was enkindled in him to participate in some fashion in such goods, and if he could not go there continuously, at least, from time to time, he might go to join the prayers of this community. This was carried into effect, and he obtained enrollment in their institution without taking away from his hermit's life, 
As often as he could, he went there to contribute to the common prayers and be refreshed with the bread of angels. Soon the renown of the example of the life of Galgano spread and waves of heavenly favors bore fruit. So many signs clearly appeared that waves of people were moved to him in order to build in sight of the holy man so as to have counsel that he might intercede for them with the Lord. This was not in vain, since he in turn attracted various lame as well as those afflicted with various infirmities that were then returned to their former health in body and soul. He humbled them with grave admonitions and exhortations to fully change their ways, as more fully said in the history of Father Lombadelli, and as we have it in the office of the saint. Here are the exact words. Desiring to hide from renown, gleaming with holy virtues, renown nevertheless spread throughout Tuscany. Women soon came from parts of Arezzo with great faith, Blessed Galgano obtained gifts of graces to those devoted faithful of Christ and all those coming to him. Elsewhere, being filled with great virtue, blessed Galgano destroyed vices, put demons to flight, cured the sick, ordered morals, informed virtues, and merited all this from the grace of holiness. And, as it is stated elsewhere in the office, the lame, lepers, sick, captives and weak, whom apathy had long wearied out, the physician of heaven had restored to health through Christ. St. Galgano practiced his strict abstinence, penance, and the harsh life that he practiced. His ailing body, formerly addicted to so many pleasures and comforts, was rendered completely indisposed by them. So ill was he that, on the feast day of St. Andrew, the last day of November in the year of our Savior, 1181, he was attacked by so violent a fever originating in his chest that it carried him away within three days. Away his soul flew to live eternally in the bosom of the Lord. His precious death happened on the third day of December in his thirty-third year of age after a year of retirement for he had ascended to Mount Siepe on December 1st of the year before, 1180. Though hidden from the eyes of men, for it is to be supposed that in the rough season not as many of the faithful were frequently brought to visit him, God wanted to make wonderfully manifest the glorification of his servant and procure for him those earthly honors that, when they are bestowed on to blessed happiness, they are to honor the Lord and his elect very directly. For example, he provided for the decent burial of the martyr Catherine, as well as Paul the first hermit, Anthony, and Mary of Egypt, and also for our Galgano. Without a miracle from his provident care, there would have long remained unburied and exposed to the ravages of wild beasts, as well as the seasons. In the Serena Valley, the bishop of Massamaritima, of which nothing is known except his name, and the bishop of Volterra, who Saladini, a nobleman of the Count de Agno, whose sacred memory is venerated, met on the day of the transitus of Galgano. Questioning each other of the night of their journey, the bishop of Massea said that he went to Siena for some business. The bishop of Volterra that he had been brought from his diocese of Quesadino, since there was a present need to provide for the replacement of the priest. The abbot of Serena Valley perished so miserably in an unjust aggression made on Mount Siepe, as was related above, all of which he told to the bishop of Massa. It was afterwards his intention to visit the hermit Galgano. The same desire was enkindled in the bishop of Massa. Suspending the trip to Quesadino, he wished to be brought immediately to Galgano. They turned, making their way while thinking on the road of his wonderful penances, as well as the graces of one so favored by the Lord. At the summit of the mountain, approaching the hut, they saw him kneeling down on the other side. Supposing him to be in deep contemplation, they stood back a pace so as not to disturb him, but waiting in such a way that naturally would cause him to turn. To that end, he made some noise, but seeing that he was still motionless and in the same posture, 
they entered the hut and approached him, only to discover that he had passed from this life. They felt deep pain for not having arrived at least a few hours earlier that they might have assisted him in his last moments, and to hear from his holy mouth words of consolation and edification, since it was the most ardent desire of that which had driven them there. They cried that they had missed a living mirror of contrition, penance, and health, but thought that they would be in some way compensated by giving the holy hermit the honors of burial. While the bishops had sent a few of their servants to seek people in order to accomplish the pious ceremony, three abbots appeared on the mount with various monks of the Cistercian order returning into Italy from the general chapter of their rule held in France. Owing to the bad weather of the sea, they were constrained to take to the land of the Sienes Maremia, and thereupon arrived there lost on the road, where they understood from the rattling of their guides that nearby there was a Roman road going in the direction they intended. Surprised to find two bishops in such a bitter wilderness, they expounded to them the mistake which had happened and asked if they could be provided with a guide. The bishops, however, recognized in their arrival a particular divine arrangement, and they declared that it was not by chance, but by the will of heaven, that they had arrived there, so that they could offer the final duties to the holy man whose life and deeds they briefly narrated. Meanwhile, news arrived at Quesadino and other nearby places surrounding it, and a great mass of people notified by the messengers of the death of Galgano made the journey to get closer to contemplate this young man, his body adorned with the effects of maceration and fasting, the air of sanctity which moved them to compunction. Some who were sick had themselves dragged up to him in order to obtain, through his intercession, the recovery of their health, since they were living with others, and a leper obtained at that very moment liberation from that disgusting disease. A woman brought her little son, being seriously injured by an accident, and knelt before the saint. Immediately he was perfectly healed. So many other favors were bestowed by the Lord on that occasion that their devotion was increased all the more. All standing around broke into tears and loudly proclaimed the sanctity of Galgano. The priest carried out the sacred rites and gave his remains an honorable burial in the same place where the sword was driven into the rock. The abbot of Casa Maria, a convent placed in the province of Campania in the kingdom of Naples, one of the three that, being lost on the road, had arrived at Mount Sieppe, was inspired by the Lord to suggest to the bishop of Volterra that on the place of the tomb of the saint, a chapel in his honor should be erected, as well as a house for a few monks to celebrate Mass, which he would provide from his own community. The proposition pleased the bishop, and generous people made large offerings. The same bishop thereupon gave the permission to build it. In the space of five years, the chapel was completed, that is, to this day, preserved intact. It is a solid and austere construction, perfectly round, over a diameter of 29 to 30 feet. Footnote. The measurements are a rough approximation of the braccio legno, or wooden arm, measurement used from the Middle Ages until the late 19th century, and used by the author, which is approximately 1.78 feet, with a tall dome and lantern, and the entire interior was painted with the deeds of the saint. Such paintings were perhaps worn out by time and forgotten, and uncultivated men covered them with new mortar and whitewashed them. Thus, now not even a vestige of them remains, nothing more than one bezel in a small chapel next to the church. As a result of the people's devotion, it grew dramatically. The graces and miracles worked from heaven through the intercession of the same saint from his tomb served to increase the offers and gifts of the neighboring cities, both of various prelates and princes, who are to serve as proof of the merits of our Galgano. There were some thoughts to erect a more grandiose church in like manner, a larger convent, but since the location of the mountain did not afford the necessary space, at the foot of the mountain, 
66 years after the death of Galgano, an immense and majestic church was built, and the Abbey of St. Galgano. It was said that it garnered the admiration of those times, but, due to a series of mournful circumstances, was left to utterly waste away, as is seen in our times. The magnificent ruins, however, are still a subject of amazements. The ruins extend over the immense shrine and monastery in a quadrangular space of not less than 711 feet on each side. The church is 231 feet long internally over a width of 80 feet in three aisles and 112 feet in the cross section. The quickness and austere form of its Gothic architecture, the rich marble and stonework, are a shining witness of those majestic ruins which still remain today. The aqueducts are also observed at the present. In their day, they provided excellent and abundant water collected with great effort and expense which have had their sources from distant places. So it is little wonder that it maintained itself in prosperous times. From authentic memory, more than 180 monks, priests, and a proportionate amount of laity dwelt there. There were so many homes containing the arts and different crafts that it could be said to have formed a city, populated by over 4,000 souls, and now, alas, the terrible story of human things, destroyed, desolate, and lonely. It is not the purpose of this compendium to expose the causes of the decay of time, which must above all else be attributed to the pestilence, particularly in the 16th century, which exercised its deadly might. Other sources may be consulted in order to have more widespread publicity, the writers of the histories of Siena, Malovetti Pecci, as well as others. I thought to briefly mention something about the magnificence of such a famous shrine, only to make it understood how much the reverence was no less present in the surrounding people that, although from remote places, what the quality of the work was wherein they contributed, dedicated to our saint. Certainly, without having seen the favors which heaven continually imparted to his intercession, they were not in fact his contemporaries, for the next generation generously accepted the gifts and bountiful offerings in his honor. With the sacred ceremonies being accomplished and burial being given to the holy body, the Cistercian abbots took monks with them on the road to Rome. Upon arriving, they informed Pope Alexander III of all the circumstances of the precious death of Galgano. Not very long after, a solemn embassy, equipped for providing the processes, faith, and testimony to His Holiness, was sent to the same pontiff from the city of Siena, as well as the community of Quesadino. They brought with them no less than the earnest supplications of many religious and famous people for the canonization of Galgano. The Supreme Shepherd, who had known the saint in Rome on the occasion of his pilgrimage, recalled to himself the miraculous revelation he had, as well as his outstanding virtue. He found the demand agreeable, and with great care and the consent of the sacred college, along with any other necessary formalities, canonized Gogano and added him to the number of confessors. He also ordered that both the office and the feast were to be carried out on the day of his death, that is, on December 3rd, so that as a very rare example he was enrolled in the number of the saints in less than a year from his death, by the same pontiff who predicted that at the end of the year he would pass to a better life. In the meantime, many notable miracles were worked at his tomb, some of which are recorded in his office. A child of eight years fell into a nearby river and drowned, but was recalled to life. He freed a woman possessed by the devil for seven years. An innocent man who had been maligned was imprisoned in the Val de Occia, but he escaped by flight and was pursued by the jailers. As they were about to overtake him, he was miraculously taken out of their sight. A woman's broken hand was restored to life, and many others are more widely reported in the life written by Father Lombardelli, of which I limit myself to a brief compendium. The round chapel had already been completed and dedicated under the invocation of St. Galgano, as well as the small monastery attached to it in the year 1186, that is, five years after his death, when the inhabitants of Quesodina and the city of Siena 
and the monks simultaneously desired to have some relics of his holy body. It was decided to exhume it. Assistant members, being authorized to undertake this tack, excavated and removed the body, and found his head and his face were preserved, as they were in life, while the rest of his body was somewhat decayed. The head, after being severed and placed in a special reliquary, was then exposed for public veneration. The rest of his body was laid in a decent casket, back in its place, so that later it could be extracted again to form relics. The last remnants were reinterred in a casket of lead sealed on four sides with the inscription, Ossa Segagani. The holy head was placed on the altar of the chapel, where it was venerated for a long time, until the abbey was dispelled, and the church at the foot of the mountain moved so that the functions could be carried out more decorously. In every sinister event, for every need, the city of Siena and other surrounding towns went to implore the divine aid through his intercession, and frequently his relics were carried in procession to Siena, in times of famine, pestilence, and for obtaining graces expressly implored. As a result, the citizens of Siena wished to keep the relics permanently. To avoid this difficulty, the long trip, and the irreverence which could happen to them, it is believed that, around the year 1300, they were placed in the monastery of St. Prosper of Siena, near the Porta Camolia, where Polisena Brizzi, the bride promised to Gogano, was vested as a nun, and died in the odor of sanctity, as was mentioned above in an earlier chapter. There the head remained for a short time, until it was taken to the cathedral in order to secure it from the hands of devoted kidnappers who had more than once tried to rush upon it. Being at last successful in their plan, they took it with them out of the city, when, between the door and the gate called Camolia, they were lost in the lawn that then existed. If they were in the thick woods, they could not find the exit, until, surprised by supernatural terror, they set down the sacred head on the ground, found the exit with ease, and fled. The great miracle is preserved in the memory of the door, where there is, above the arch on the guard's side, a painting depicting the head in a tabernacle that has two angels lifted up off the earth to bring it back to the monastery of St. Prospero, as in fact happened. Later, the head of St. Ogana was placed in the cathedral, and after that, it was transferred to the church of the hospital of Lescela in front of the cathedral in order to satisfy the devotion of the poor patients. In 1477, at the request of the monks of the abbey of San Galgano, it was taken to their hospice, which was near the bridge in the vicinity of the Porta Romana. It was called the Magdalene, and the abbot at that time was named Bartolomeno. On that occasion, he compensated the hospice and the church for their inestimable loss by placing the precious relic at the altar. More recently, in 1550, it was brought to where it rests presently, that is, in the church of the monastery of St. Mary of the Angels, commonly called the Santo Cizio, next to the Porta Romana. The many translations were caused by either the fear that the head would be abducted, or the fervent desire of various devotees who longed to possess it, though we do not know for sure in either instance. What we do know, however, is that wherever it was, it was indeed always held in veneration, and conducted frequently in procession through the city in any urgent need. When Father Lombardelli wrote to say farewell in 1577, it was perfectly preserved and intact, as revealed from his narrative in this regard, where, after having described the magnificence of the reliquary formed of precious metals, enriched with gems and adorned with an engraved legend and outline describing the most remarkable actions of the saint, the following words invents its condition. This most precious head is forthright in all parts, and in front has a small and subtle scratch on the right side. It is beardless, but with a full head of hair as cloth of gold, that has a veneer like silk. Its look is jolly, nearer to being full of bright color that lights up as if it were alive, and with a few freckles, so that in some I believe few relics can compare with it. 
I do not possess sufficient ink to write with a pen how beautiful it seems, both concerning the person and the mind, when many years are all seen. But as for the many miracles God has shown it, I will say in the next chapter. From this description it is gathered that over the course of four centuries the sacred head had been preserved as though it were alive. Now, however, below the eyelashes is reduced almost to a skeleton, retaining only a little bit of skin on the cheeks, but the forehead and scalp are always in pristine condition, retaining the hair seen since the time of Father Lombardelli. In sum, during the entire time it was venerated in Siena, so many favors were obtained through the sacred head's intercession. Even from the first moment it was transferred from the Abbey of St. Gogano in 1300, that it was deemed fit to establish that twice a year it would be conveyed around the city in order that the public desire to venerate the head could be satisfied. The Feast of Pentecost and the Assumption of Mary were the two most frequently chosen. In the year 1477 for famine, pestilence, and calamity, the rulers of the Republic made a record of the many favors obtained through the intercession of the saint. In the city council held in the palace of the Signori, marked by a resolution of the 28th of April, 1477, it was stated that on the third day of December, the commemoration of the saint was to be observed as a public holiday, and that for the two processions spoken above, the sacred head was to be accompanied by ten different people with torches and the insignia of the Republic, as well as four gentlemen to support the canopy, as is done on the day of St. Rocco. Simultaneously, they transported, accompanied by those ceremonies, the head of St. Catherine, the Apostolic Virgin, and the arm of the martyr St. Ansanius, the first promulgator of the Holy Gospel in that city. The ceremony surrounding the sacred head of St. Gogano lasted for many years, but with the passing of time, most of the usual processions were left out for various reasons. The head is not taken out now except from time to time for low Sunday, the custom on that day being to make the procession with some of the various images and relics that are useful in greater devotions, and by now it has been more than forty years since it has been taken out for various reasons. Narrator's footnote. This book was written in 1835. In the same year, 1477, the University of Siena, called De La Setta, chose St. Galgano in particular as its patron. Many are the miracles that illustrate the sacred head at all times, as the ancient chroniclers and traditions reveal, and many of those reports in this regard Father Lombardelli considered more authentic. From these I will choose some. At that time it was brought back from Siena to the Abbey of San Gogano. A troop willing to kidnap it was placed in ambush on the road. When the mare, upon which the head was placed, came near to them, it began to double its pace of its own will, until it could not be in any way reached. The danger passed. They brought the head to the doors of the chapel where the body was, lest anyone should wish to remove it. As soon as they reached those who were chosen for the guardianship of the head, they easily guided it to the abbey's care. On another occasion, all storms appeared to have ceased, and the sky became instantly clear. During some of the festivals when the head was exposed for public veneration, it seemed to exude a fragrant liquor that brought health to the sick, when they were recommended with lively faith to the Lord through the intercession of the saint. The hair has been cut many times for relics, and has always been returned to the pristine length, a miracle which continues to this day. It is always preserved very long and abundant, though often it has been cut to the end, and again recently, I myself have seen it with my own eyes, in same quantity and length, as it is described by Father Lombardelli, and every one is led to venerate the sacred head can attest to this. Epilogue by Dom Noah Morbeg of the Poor Knights of Christ. Our Lord asks in the Gospel of St. Luke, What woman, having ten drachmas, if she loses one drachma, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek carefully till she find it? The true story of the sword in the stone and the marvelous conversion of St. Gogano is one of those coins that we hope, with this little work, will light a lamp to the cave of conversion, 
where a sword became a cross. The lives of many popular saints today have become as so many coins to enrich the hearts of the faithful. Saint Therese for her little way, Saint Padre Pio for his obedience and suffering, Saint Louis de Montfort for his total consecration to Mary, and so on. But what in the life of Saint Gogano, a knight and a hermit, can enrich the faithful today? I found out about Saint Gogano when I became a novice in the Militia Templi. Footnote. The Militia Templi is under the jurisdiction of the Catholic Archdiocese of Siena. The Militia Templi's member follow a modern adaptation of the rule written by Saint Bernard de Clairvaux for the Knights Templar. As he was a patron of our order, I was taught that he was a knight, was given a very brief account of the sword and the stone. I also received a prayer card with his collect and a picture on it. Blessed with a first-class relic of him, when I went through the ritual to become a novice in the Militia Templi at Christ in the Desert Monastery in New Mexico. The current protector of the Militia Templi is Abbot Philip Lawrence, Order St. Benedict. Our rule and our constitutions are designed primarily with the idea of a community of brothers praying and working together. However, in the United States, the Knights are relatively isolated and live at great distances from one another. Without the help and consolations of community life, we have often recalled the example of St. Golgano to encourage one another. Catholics today who wish to fully live their faith often find themselves isolated in their local church and even in their own family. St. Gogano's mother prayed for his conversion, but despite her piety, became an obstacle to his vocation when he became a hermit. Was God's will for Gogano to become a missionary? To start a new devotion or write down spiritual visions? Perhaps become a great teacher? No. God called Gogano to adore the sign of his salvation, the Holy Cross. God performed a miracle to show how easy it is to forgive our sins, and St. Gogano embraced a life of penance. Today, it seems very few Christians doubt the mercy and love of God, but are there great fruits of repentance? Our blessed Lord said, Unless you shall do penance, you shall all likewise perish. While today, it would seem that some live and teach that to do real penance is to somehow foster a doubt that God has forgiven us. Blessed Columbia Marmion said that penance is the greatest possible assurance of perseverance in the way of perfection, because it is, when one really looks at it, one of the purest forms of love. St. Gogano faced the hardships of nature, the persecution of family, and temptations from the devil to separate him from the sign of his salvation. This penitential life was too much for some. Even the local abbot and priest set out to harm him because of the rebuke that such steadfastness offered to their laxity. The assault on sanctuaries, devotions, piety, and the malicious assaults on the faithful are all the more common in our time. The wicked clerics were successful in molesting his hermitage, but the Lord keepeth all them that love him, but all those wicked he will destroy." Galgano's sword that was broken by their malice was restored through Galgano's prayer. We can be assured that God will not allow the cross to be taken from us, and the wicked who seek to destroy these things will themselves be destroyed. Do we live lives of sin, indulgence, and comfort, full of too much free time? So did St. Galgano. Perhaps we gave up a life of heavy sin to embrace a more devout life, but lapsed in our devotion at some point. So did St. Gogano. Despite these two things, St. Gogano came to great sanctity, from the moment the sword entered the stone to his death one year later. If God numbers all things, and Gogano had resisted God's last call with but one year to live, he would have died before he ever enjoyed a long marriage and would have never become the great saint that he is. We know not how much time we have left, and if we examine ourselves, Will we find that we have done any worthy penance for our sins? If we cooperate with God to make us into great saints, he can do so in a short amount of time, as he did with St. Gogano. May God, through the intercession of St. Gogano, drive the sword of his holy gospel through our hard hearts, that we might fully embrace the holy cross and become rooted in penance 
sprung out of faith in Christ, hope in salvation, and the love of the crucified Jesus. Saint Golgano, pray for us.